for joining us. Um, I'll be inviting on stage June Abo from Transcom, uh, Ali uh, from Manulife, and Flo from i uh, each of each of whom had the talent acquisition function for their respective companies, which all hire uh, north of 5,000 people a year in, in the Philippines alone. Um, and so we'll be talking to them about onboarding and hiring without an office. After that, um, I'll, I'll be holding the mic for a little bit longer to, to talk about what we've experienced at TalkPush um, in, in the last year, overcoming the fear that uh, was uh, initiated by the crisis and building on the, the change that was forced in the market. And then afterwards, we have a networking session. So we have a 150 plus people currently online. We, you'll have a chance to interact with each other and you'll have a chance to interact with the panelists at random uh, very soon at the end of the session. But also the reason why you should stay online till the very end is because if you stay, you'll be entered to win a raffle. And if you win the raffle, Talk Push will pay for a slice of pizza for everybody in your in your recruitment team, terms and conditions apply. You know we don't want a hundred people team, <laughs> uh, but maybe we'll go up to ten or twenty. We'll see. Um, and so you get a chance to uh, to feed pizza uh, to your whole whole team, whether they're working at home or they're working in an office. Um, if you win the raffle, so we thought that would be a good good team building exercise. Uh, well, outcome if we could win this. So, um, so yeah. So, I'll, as I was saying, um, these are these are the panelists uh, who will be joining me on stage right now: June, Alith, and Florette from Transcom, Manulife, and Icor, respectively. And so, ladies, gentlemen, um, if you'd be kind enough to join me on stage, hi, June. Hey, Max. Hello, Flo. Hey, Max. Hi, everyone. And Alif, hello. Fantastic. Uh, thank you all for joining. Welcome, welcome to the stage. Um, Thanks, Max. So, so you all, you all had um, the HR function or talent acquisition function for some of the largest employers in the Philippines. And, um, and uh, about a, a year plus ago, you all had to adapt to a really rapid change. And um, I think we're all past the trauma of how to adapt a little bit, and we've kind of shaken it off. Um, but um, but let, let's take us back to, uh, to that time, perhaps, of a year ago, when the biggest challenges of hiring remotely, and particularly on the onboarding side, hit you in the face. Um, can you can you remind us uh, what you went through at that time? And um, I I don't have a, I don't have a particular order in mind, so maybe we'll do alphabetically, starting with you, Ali. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Well, it's very. I think I've had a very interesting experience in this pandemic, simply because I was actually in a different organization when I first joined uh, or when I first um, experienced a pandemic. And I was the global head for onboarding for that bank. Um, so I was managing um, all the regions uh, across the world and was basically the one responsible for ensuring that the digital onboarding was happening. Um, and then I decided for some crazy reason to change organizations. So I actually experienced the digital onboarding as an as a candidate, right? So I think you know from both of those perspective, the main um, concern was really how do you maintain the candidate experience, and um, it was very interesting because I didn't have the best experience onboarding on uh, with Manulife, and that was actually the reason I decided to take their um, job offer and really focus because. I said I can do I can do this better than how they're doing it now, and because I was a candidate right at that point in time, and you know it was really seeing that in both and in both perspectives really just highlighted how this pandemic is going to turn everything into a digitalization concern, um, as well as you know coordinating with the with the government. So it was such a shock 
to actually be going through that last year. Yeah, that's that's a really good hot tip for everybody who's in talent acquisition, which I know is most of the audience. If you're applying for a company that has a horrible onboarding process, that's it. That's that's where you should be working because you you got a lot of things you can fix. <laughs> Great, thank you, uh, uh, Flo. Um, uh, tell us about the those challenges from from a, a year plus ago, and and particularly on the onboarding side. So, Max, I told my husband that. Once we have grandkids, I'm going to be spending days and days talking about the horrible experience of pandemic because we get to live through it, right? But as we all know, there are so many learnings um, that came through. But let me discuss to you a few things that really shocked us to our core because there is no playbook, there is no training that will prepare you for this. So one is it was really difficult to connect with employees, right? You can't just call them and expect them to pick up the phone. And on the onboarding side, it was so difficult for us to get all the documents completed on time. So every company will have a list of, you know, mandatory contractual um, requirements for them to be able to join us. And that has been really difficult. And then in addition to that, when the government started reducing the capacities of your government agencies, like NBI, Mm -hmm. You know, the schools aren't open. Their online portal is not very helpful. Mm -hmm. You have issues with your pre-employment medical clinics. All of those put together is clearly, you know, a nightmare. And I'm sure everyone in attending this event is nodding their head, trying to, you know, relieve that experience. So when you put really big issues in front of people, that's when you're going to see teams actually working together. Because for us, this is the time that we have to prove our worth. This is the time that you have to do the noble job of giving Filipinos the jobs that they need. So mm -hmm. yeah, I can I can go on and on, but trust me, you want June to also weigh in. <laughs> I do, I do. Uh, but yeah, there's there's a double message here. It's like on one hand, it's overwhelming. On the other hand, it's hero mode. This is when we this is when we do our most important work. So that was, uh, I think, I think a lot of people went through through those two emotions at that time. Yeah, June. Yeah, I, I echo everyone's sentiment. Uh, there is an uh, Chinese curse that goes, "May he live in interesting times," and like it or not, we are living in interesting times. Um, just like everyone else, when we transition to uh, the lockdown and the the pandemic, its impact on work. Um, initially thoughts within the talent acquisition team, it's okay, we're not going to be hiring. So there's not enough work for us. But lo and behold, after a month of uh, slowdown, we started hiring and hiring and hiring. Um, one of the few questions uh, that we started asking ourselves is, um, with our onboarding process, how do we make our candidates feel that they've made the right decision in terms of joining Transcom? Second one, and the most important one for me, I think it's how do we make them excited about being part of uh, the Transcom culture? Um, how do we help them prepare for the role that they signed up for? And how will employees fit in uh, based on the new team, which they could not be meeting for weeks or even months? Um, what we've learned early on, it's... Uh, the pandemic and the shifting to working at home, it, it's much easier for new employees to resign when there's no feeling of loyalty for mm. the first one have developed. And again, organizational culture appears poor or remote because again, most of our organization was centered towards building that rapport, that engagement and culture when they're on site, when you can see them, when you can touch them, when you can talk to them. But how do you translate that into this new normal? So. Yeah, the, those are the challenges uh, that uh, we face uh, early on. I'm gonna, I'm gonna go back to what uh, what Flo was talking about and the the paperwork and working with the the administrative side of onboarding. But but before going there, you touched upon a key point, June, which is the fact that there's you don't have the same opportunity now when you onboard someone to make them feel part of a community. And so it's easier for them to just, you know, stop showing up. Um, and and uh, I'm sure we're all looking for ways to create that 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 social fabric uh, while, while not meeting people in person. 
Um, I'd, I'd love to get some of the tips from this, uh, you know, very experienced panel. What, what are some of the initiatives that you, you can recommend as part of the onboarding specifically that will make somebody who is not going to shake your hands, not give you a hug, not have a meal with you, still feel part of the group and the community? Uh, what, what are some of the, you know, actionable tips you can offer our listeners, our viewers? Um, I, I think, you know, one of the things that really a very low hanging fruit that we did was to change our templates, right? You know, you have, you always have candidate templates that you send out via email and automated responses. And we really made it into a point um, that they were a little bit more engaging, warmer, and, you know, I mean, just adding, um, I hope you're safe as you receive this, those types of little nuggets that you input just to help them understand that you do understand that there's um, something happening in the world that may not let them um, respond as quickly as usual. I think one of the other things also on those templates is that um, we really spoke with cross functions and had them understand that from a candidate experience standpoint, we're seeing um, we're seeing that there's a better opportunity to engage. So especially with hiring managers, um, tapping them and having them communicate better with their um, near hires, not even the ones who have accepted offers yet, but mm -hmm. really tapping the hiring managers to ensure that they're part of that community and making sure that they understand that if somebody is, you know, wasn't able to appear on an interview and there was no notice, we can't just blacklist them <laughs> because that was in, in some functions that was what they did but our next reaction is always are they okay and we would send out a message saying we noticed that you did you weren't able to do your interviews are you okay um and those little nuggets really helped us ensure that they see us as um, a caring organization but and we really meant it too you know so it was really just um putting more of our heart in the communication instead of just taking it off as another template to be sent out Right. So don't don't listen to your instincts and uh, send him a hate mail. No, just hold back. <laughs> OK, I just been ghosted again. Something could have happened. Compassion first. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, just to just to add, I think uh, this remote working environment, it, it provides a sense of not fitting in. It can develop really quickly, especially with the lack of interaction. Uh, I really agree that you can't over communicate enough. Um, you, we need to make sure that the candidates would uh, feel that sense of belongingness right from the get go. Um, one tip I could share with you guys, it's uh, and for the ones watching, it's we've uh, started investing in our onboarding uh, concierge. So it's both people driven and automated. Um, so for people driven, we have our onboarding uh, ambassadors. So these are folks who would manage the relationship and the communication from the moment a candidate signs their job offer all the way up to they show up. Uh, they attend their training. They do their orientation. The relationship is there. So if there are any questions, concerns that the new employees too shy to ask their hiring manager or supervisor, then the onboarding uh, ambassador is going to be there. That's going to be their buddy. Uh, so they can ask questions um, or even um, escalate concerns. Um, I mentioned automating it. And you know, Max, I've been working closely with your team on how we can automate our onboarding process, especially for our frontline advisors. Um, and the key for us when automating that, it's um, how do we focus on cultural immersion so that, again, focusing on that sense of belongingness, leveraging on our well-being platform and programs? Because, uh, again, like what the earlier speakers in the earlier panel mentioned, employee wellness and well-being, mental health is important. How do you create that sense of belonging? And um, we also try to add that virtual meet and greets, uh, virtual coffee chats with our new hires. Great. Great. Flo, did you want to do you want to um, add to the topic? Was everything covered? I can move to the next question. Yeah, go ahead, Max. OK, I will. <laughs> um, I'm, well, it's an ever ending topic anyway. How do we make people feel at home? But 
Um, I do like the uh, the ambassador suggestion. It's um, it goes a little bit against what uh, Kalpak was saying, where he was talking about the generalist, where everything is handled by technology and and recruitment is done by a generalist. There's still room for specialization, perhaps, with like a, a, a specialist onboarding, specialist sourcing. I don't think that that debate is uh, settled, of course. Um, the we we talked a little bit about uh, you. You were mentioning people who quit their jobs a little bit more easily when they don't come to the office. Um, how has the um, has the experience of the journey from somebody applying, being shortlisted, being hired, uh, and then actually showing up on day one on the job, um, has that funnel? Um, yielded some surprises and some shockers compared to a year ago. Um, in other words, what what are some of the drop-off points that people should be on the lookout for where there's a risk of somebody disappearing, you know, playing, doing a Houdini on you? Um, what uh, what can you share with us on this flow or? Yes, yes, you're sure. unmuted. Um. You know, the, the unfortunate reality is that you have to measure dropouts on every step of the way. So um, because I have visibility for all recruitment and all of HR, you know, we, we track this and, and it is making us sad. You know, I do have recruiters. And by the way, you know, plugging hi, hi to my loving um, HR and recruitment team. They come to me and say that they got ghosted in real life on their personal life. And even at work, they get ghosted. So it is becoming to be something that they're very concerned about. And what you can do is, is first, you know, work with the data that is available for you, right? And based on that data, um, think if you have, so we have consumed days, not only hours, but days looking at the data, trying to analyze why people are ghosting us. And some of the data points that I can share to the team is that, one, are they not showing up after the offer? So for sure, it has something to do with the offer, 80, 90% of the time. Are they not showing up when you give them a long list of you know, onboarding documents? I can tell you that they're afraid and they don't have the time and they don't want to go to those physical offices to get those documents. So. What we have done is really an investment all around, an investment on technology, an investment, and let me talk about technology first. Um, we have we made sure because the 201 folders that are used, you know, it's something that we used to call many decades ago, and I'm probably giving away my age. Um, that is a thing of the past. You cannot do 201 folders anymore, physical ones, right? So we have invested on a platform wherein candidates can submit. It can be uploaded, indexed in that particular platform so that when someone needs to audit you, it is available on your fingertips, right? The second part is we have made an investment on a vendor. If your candidates cannot go or do not want to go to government agencies, schools, right? You have someone to do that for them. I know this is not something that everyone is accustomed to. Not all companies are not willing to make that investment. I get it. But for us, we have computed the financial benefits of doing that versus not doing that. So every person that we don't hire is obviously, you know, a, a loss in revenue. So you just have to put forth, you know, a good financial, you know, comparison on the investment versus the loss of revenue. So, and above all that, Max, you know, I. I, you know that I'm, you know, I'm a mother and happy Mother's Day to, to everyone um, that is here. Um, technology and platforms can only work if you have parents and support systems that can nurture them, right? So you have to train them properly. You have to invest on them the same way that we invest on our kids' education. You need to make sure that you're patient because technology will not work 100% of how you um, desire um, the, the technology to work. So again, spending time with your frontliners is critical. Spending time understanding what the candidates are talking about you is really critical at this point in time. Mm -hmm. Just to add to that one, um, for one of the aha moments that we've seen, and, and I'm talking about our uh, CSRs and TSRs, the frontline advisors, we've seen an increase in terms of fallouts um, across the various stages of our recruitment funnel. Um, 
it's really critical that you have a very rigid uh, and uh, strict funnel management um, in place, just so that you know what's going on at every stages of the funnel. But just focusing on the fallouts at the end of the funnel. So we see fallouts um, for those folks who signed their job offers, but did not proceed with their uh, pre-employment background checks. Um, we've seen folks who've signed their employment contracts, but did not show up on day one. And when we try to look at the different drivers, what we've noticed is that um, we've categorized our candidates, our new employees, into three profiles. The starters, the shifters, and the adapters. Starters fresh out of school. Shifters are those with BPO experience. And then you have the adapters who are coming from different industry, first time to work in a BPO. Shifters, what we found out, it's they have a tendency to get attracted to the next shiny object. So even though they've signed a job offer, if another company comes along and offers them 500 pesos, a thousand more than what they got on their job offer, they jump to that offer and ghost you. For adapters and uh, starters, um, it's more important that um, we are able to reaffirm that they made that right decision. Um, so identifying what are the different um, drivers that would trigger their motivations. So for example, is there a specific benefit that we have that we can then uh, share with them so as uh, they're more inclined to push through with uh, joining us. Um, and I think a lot of it, it's really how you properly communicate it um, and ensure that you have the right platform, uh, that you're able to send uh, these communication templates, uh, messages, as well mm -hmm. as have a, a live person that can still reach out and address their concerns at any given time. A real human being, flesh and bone? A real human being. Oh. So old school, fine, <laughs> fine. We're not we're not over yet. The robots haven't haven't won yet. Okay. Well, I um, I think I think you you raised um, you know an important uh, old school uh, weapon or a tactic of, of the recruiter, which is adapt to your audience. You know, recruitment is sales. Adapt to your audience. Um, the the audience, of course, is shifting. The psychology of the candidates is different than it was a year ago. Uh, their their demands are different. A lot of things have changed, and so I, I'd like to ask our panelists um, about the demands of the new hires. What are some of the questions that they ask now that you never thought they would have asked, you know, a year or maybe two, three years ago? Or, or, or let's just say that the frequency of these questions has risen up. What are some of the uh, new trends in terms of demands and uh, th that we need to anticipate for uh, in talent acquisition. Alice? Yeah. Um, yeah, I think, thanks, Max. I think, you know, um, it's it's maybe less of a trend, but more of it's like a huge impact now, right? Of course, everybody is basically having nightmares about the question, do I need to work on site if you're hiring for contact centers. Um, the current quarantine conditions that change every week that determine public safety, you know, public transportation and all of those things really affect decisions um, at a daily basis. That's one of the things. Um, the other thing also is that for, so manual life hires across, you know, actuarial analysts to salespeople to the contact center role and um what we can really see is that there is um an ask in terms of what mental wellness support we have um we have um questions about um how do we support the family so there's really this need to not just speak about monetary compensation but non-monetary as well and um, how often do they need to the office for manual life currently for most of us 90 percent we still work from home and we don't see that changing over the next um year or so given where our vaccination is so um even when we share to people um to the earlier panel's point you know do you want to work from home or stay on site and that leads to a different type of conversation every single time I think one of the other things that links to the initial question or to the former question that you had was 
the major fallout for most of our hires right now, because and maybe because I'm volume hiring IT roles, is internet interruptions. <laughs> so the current assessment that we have logs of people after 60 minutes and uh, sorry, 60 seconds. So it automatically fails them and we have to adapt to that because a lot of our people may be on prepaid or a short borrowed postpaid. So I think that's really it. It's really supporting them, not on the process itself of hiring, but you know what's in it for me as you support me through the pandemic. Mm -hmm. So that's a very good, uh, sorry, just to add, I think the employee value proposition for work at home needs to evolve. Again, going back to what I shared earlier, uh, a lot of the traditional BPOs, our employee value proposition is centered around working on site. Case in point for Transcom, we have childcare facility on site. You have uh, coffee shops on site. You have gyms on site. But what use is, are all of these on-site facilities uh, if your employees are working at home? How do you then evolve the employee value proposition? So when you're targeting folks whose preference is working at home, that you're still able to attract them um, and what's attractive for them. Um, I agree with the em uh, employee mental wellness. Uh, that's one of our uh, the key programs that uh, we've heard our employees asking for us to do more. Um, we've also seen an interesting development that's actually what we're seeing as a trend, especially in our Visaya sites, it's for those without any call center experience, they're actually interested in working on site just because they know that they don't have any previous call center experience. Uh, they would like to be trained and mentored closely by supervisors and by trainers. So we're now looking at um, bringing in training uh, so as they can then be handled um, and get the proper training and uh, mentoring by their trainers and supervisors. Hey, Max, I'm, I'm going to add something that is slightly off topic, but very much related. Okay. So, you know, talking about internet issues, that that's a given. In fact, you know, all the companies have lobbied for IBPAP to really talk to the telco companies to make sure that this is on top of their radar. You know, you can only push so much work at home as long as the technology can support it. So the topic that I wanted to, to share with the group is, I think it was mentioned briefly earlier that new hires always want to work from home because of the fear of the pandemic. However, once they started doing that, they realized that first, it is not sustainable, you know, very noisy, you know, you have siblings, you have parents or vice versa that are very noisy in the background with roosters and dogs that are making noise. The air con, the air con. Yeah. It's, and fan, not always aircon, Max, fans, right? So um, you do have this real problems. And then they realize that it's not only that I miss my, my colleagues, my friends, but it is not logically possible for me to sustain, sustain this. And then they do the reverse. They ask to be placed back in the office. But then, you know, we just have to, companies will have to weigh that in versus, you know, what, what the government is, is asking us to do, right? You can only have so much um, capacity at work. And then the other um, issue that we're also seeing is that, um, you know, the engagement, regardless if you coach, you train, at some point in time, you need to think of something new, whether it's gamification, whether it's giving them, you know, five minutes of doing something radical. I think those are the things that will keep them engaged, right? They're, they're, people are so done being at home. Um, whether it's for work or or personal reasons, it, it's just something that we need to be um, aware of and cognizant of. I um, I believe uh, everybody is uh, is reading the same articles. We all are people coming back to the office in uh, in some parts of the world, but actually, office. I just looked at stats that. Just this week, uh, office occupancy in the U.S., which is supposed to be way ahead of most of the countries in terms of vaccination, still only at uh, 25 or 30 percent of what it was a year, you know, 14 months ago. 
So it will definitely take a while. And so this investment in wellness and well-being is is uh, absolutely an investment, uh, a smart investment today. Because uh, if you know if it's if it's bad today and people are fed up today, it's it's definitely going to be. Uh, you can imagine it's just going to be worse six months from now. So so uh, anticipate anticipate. Um, now talking about something uh, a little not really related, but uh, we talked about our our new hires being fed up. What about our what about our recruiters being fed up, uh, having to to do all that uh, chasing of documents and all that repetitive mundane work around onboarding, repeating to them, go through the checklist, send me the documents, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, it can be a very repetitive task. Now, um, tell me, what do you think can be automated? Um, I mean, it's uh, it's definitely something that my company is working on. We don't have to do any, any product placement here, but but I'm I'm just kind of curious what what your thoughts are on what can be automated and what will remain, uh, you know, human. So, Max. Um... By alluded earlier to a long list of um, requirements, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah. It it begins with a serious review of the HR team with the support of their operations leadership team to really review it. Is it mandatory? Yes or no? Is it contractual obligation with the client? Yes or no? Or maybe it's a nice to have because we have been collecting it for many years. You know, until now we carry that. You know, that practice. So. You know, we've done that. It's a painful exercise, but the result coming out of that exercise was huge, right? So, you know, from, from a list of couple dozens to now, you know, very critical. And by the way, again, because of the pandemic, you have to categorize them. Which documents do you need pre-offer, pre-onboarding, and post-onboarding? Okay. I'm addressing the elephant in the room. I don't think that all companies are going to share, you know, all their issues, all their problems. Um, I, I am doing that a little bit so that folks can, can actually learn. Um, what I can share to ad address that problem, I will repeat a bit of what I shared earlier, is that um, what every time you invest on a technology, and, and Max should be happy if I say this, every time you invest on technology, don't think of it as an additional expense for the company you have to really weigh in and compare how much revenue loss are you experiencing for not being able to hire them on time. Not only hire them, but hire them on time. So every week that you're missing filling in your classes, that equates to thousands of dollars for, for every company, right? Um, so technology platform, you need to be able to submit, index, and report on those documents real time. Um, it, it cannot, there couldn't be any delay um, in, in those particular processes. Um, latency is something that we hate, right? Um, we cannot afford issues of system being down, latency. So, you know, those have to be considered when, when choosing the right technology platform and even the vendors that you're going to be working with. Uh, for me, just going back to your question, what can be automated? Um, free day one communication um how to keep your candidates warm um from the moment they sign a uh, job offer reach a certain process all the way up to day one the communication there can be automated document collection can be automated and tracking um and then document uh, creation uh so employment offers and contracts including signatures that can also be digitized and automated So that's that's quite a quite a lot, June. Quite a lot. In fact, uh, with your permission, in my next presentation, I'll I'll, I'll give a sneak peek of a robot you have running on Facebook. Permission granted. Yes. <laughs> All right. Uh, great. Well, uh, Alitha, did, did you want to add to the topic uh, on on automation, or was everything covered? We move on to the next question. We can move on. Okay. All right, I'm going to look at uh, audience questions then. Um, blah, blah, blah. Um, audience questions. Let's see. We have one audience uh, about wearing multiple hats. Are you considering partnering with recruitment firms? What are the things you expect from them? Okay. I think that's an interesting question. 
Um, staffing firms used to account for for you know maybe twenty percent of hires in the in the BPO sector and uh, in um, in this uh, in this space. Um, I think that number has come down, but the RPO sector, our recruitment process outsourcing, always does well on on the back end of a of a recession or of a crisis because it gives companies an opportunity to grow without having to uh, grow their headcount internally too fast uh, for TA. Uh, what has been? Uh, what, do you think that uh, staffing firms and recruitment partners? Um, have a nice uh, future ahead of them, a, next, a nice few quarters ahead of them, or do you see that their their share of hire will continue uh, to to fall um, in trend with the last five years? Anyone? So, my my own personal experience has been that um, you know what June said earlier. We thought we were not gonna hire right a lot, and we actually ended up hiring a lot. And one of the you know, two sides of a coin where countries, especially first world countries, can cope quickly enough with the effect of the economy, then they move the work to third world countries or developing organizations where labor is a lot less. And that really means that countries like the Philippines and, you know, locations like Chengdu start getting this huge amount of work migration that you did not plan or forecast for. And that's really where the RPO and the third party comes in, right? Um, I think that definitely an RPO and the, the third party vendors for direct placements are um, one of the three legs of my stool right now that's keeping me sitting quite well. Um, on the other hand, though, I think there is definitely a change in the way that we interact with the RPO or the third party vendors. Um, there is a very we find that they can't cast a wide net right now. We have to be very specific in terms of sourcing strategies and be very, very strategic in what requisitions we give to them and for how long. So I think from an internal recruiting team standpoint, the team is a little bit more hands-on, even the junior recruiters who work directly with the, with the vendors recruiters. We actually have to be very aligned in terms of KPIs and deliverables. And be aware that, you know, um, the best way to coordinate right now is really just for open communication and consistency and let them know that, you know, we basically have to um, ensure that they were aligned in terms of the profiles and targets that we have. But they're currently, mm. I mean, like, we Quite depend integrated. on them. Yeah. yeah. Quasi integrated. It's kind of like the RPO model more than than the traditional staffing firm model. Yes. Oh, yeah. Great, Max. If I may, yeah. um, I like recruiting firms that are results based, right? So obviously, depending on how many you hire, you know that that's the contract that you have with them. Um, we have our fair share of successes with some of our recruiting partners, but also something that I'm not sure if my peers have um, encountered. Because our leads management database is so big and robust, when a recruiting firm gives us a list of 100, 90 plus percent of those people are actually on our leads database, right? Specifically, our offices are on in, in the provinces where we are either, you know, the, the biggest or, or the top three biggest. So it's really difficult. Um, I'm, I'm being upfront and honest that recruiting partners will remain important to BPOs but also they need to think of a way of how to elevate their game as well. Because again, we have those names in our own databases. Yeah, for, for us, I think we've been fortunate to have weaned ourselves uh, from uh, headhunters. And this is for uh, volume hiring, um, for non-volume hiring. So these are for support folks, management executives, they will always have a niche. Uh, specialized hiring like multilinguals, yes, will tap uh, RPOs and headhunters. But for volume hiring, we're fortunate enough to have followed the global trend. It's gone down year over year. I think our highest was around 24% higher share two, three years ago. Now it's 5% higher share. Um, and I think part of it, it's because we keep asking ourselves, these guys are sourcing on the, based on the same pool that we're sourcing. So we just need to do a better job in terms of talent attraction. 
Um, and one of the things uh, that we wanted to get away from, it's we don't want to just keep on getting leads and endorsements from headhunters. We want them, if a vendor would like to partner with us, they need to own um, part of the recruitment funnel management, chase after their candidates all the way up to uh, the job interview stages. So yeah, the, I think uh, the future for headhunters, for volume hiring, for transcom, it's going to continue to go uh, get a smaller piece of the hiring share pie. Okay. All right. Well, same message, up your game, specialize, um, and uh, otherwise uh, your market share will shrink. Uh, you've heard it. Uh, you've heard it from the the panel. I'm sure. I'm sure the recruiters have that competitive fiber that will. They'll find a way to reinvent themselves, as we all do. In fact, uh, that will be uh, the topic of my next presentation, and uh, and I'm going to I'm going to jump into that um, and thank my esteemed panelist uh, June Alith uh, Flo for for joining us. They they had some of the most cutting edge. Uh, talent acquisition operations in in the in one of the most uh, you know tech aggressive markets in the world, the Philippines, which uh, you know I've had the pleasure of working with for for years. And um, well, uh, thanks for sharing. And uh, of course, uh, you know where to reach them. They're all they're all on LinkedIn. And uh, if if you want to continue uh, chatting with them, I'm sure they'd be they're they're going. I hope they're going to be attending the networking session later. Um, June, Aleth, uh, Flo, thank you very much for your time. Thank you thank so much, Max. Hi. Thanks so much. Bye, guys. Okay. Um,